Uh, Dr. Phil here. I'm going to start chapter four. I've been fighting with the MacBook. It won't play the videos. The tablet won't connect to the Wi-Fi at home. Uh, it will at ECC. Can't ask. So I've got <clears throat> just working on this uh, ThinkPad. So uh, I'm just dealing with it. It's not a MacBook. And it is it has a mind of its own here. Are you kidding me right now? I literally didn't touch a thing. Okay, so I want to go through chapter four. So characteristics of cells in life. We'll go through this, talk a little bit about um bacteria, gram positive, gram negative. I know I talked about it in lab. Go over some um of the structures of uh bacteria and some of the outer structures, flagella, capsules, things like that. And then uh, chapter five, I'm hoping is review for everyone. That should be eukaryotic cells. So you should have had that in biology. You should have had it uh, biology in high school. If you took that, you should have, but should have had it in human bio or survey of anatomy physiology or A and P, depending on uh, who your instructor was. Um, you know, I can't change the past, but that should all be review. Um, we'll go over some of the basic structures. I embedded a couple of videos in Blackboard. So watch the one on um, the cell, the animation. It will, um, I think it, I don't know, it's under 20 minutes, but it's actually pretty good. It's made by Nucleus uh, Media. They do some pretty good videos. So um, anyway, all living things, singular, mostly are made of cells that share some common characteristics. Okay, so on an exam, they'll ask you, you know, what are things that are common to bacteria? What are things that are common to eukaryotic or prokaryotic? They'll ask you, you know, what's different between a prokaryote and eukaryote? Those are basic questions. They're going to ask you that. So you're going to get one or two questions on it. So that's two points, you know, whatever you want to do, you want to learn it or not learn it. They're going to ask you on an exam. They'll ask you again on in some, in, in your future at some point, some exam. So basic shape would be spherical, uh, cubical or cylindrical. Um, and that can be, we'll be talking about cells of a eukaryotic cell. Um, cell or we'll be talking about shapes of a, uh, uh, yeah, a, a prokaryotic cell. Uh, in lab, we, um, for one of your homeworks, there was uh, stuff on bacterial uh, shape, whether it's cocci, diplococci, spiral, um, tetrad, or, or whatever. So, internal component, all, pretty much all cells, whether they're eukaryotic or prokaryotic, have cytoplasm surrounded by some type of membrane. And just realize, you know, the cytoplasm is going to be liquid. Uh, it's where all of the um, metabolic activities take place. And that membrane, if it's functioning properly, is going to uh, allow things in and out of the cell. So if we have a way of altering that membrane or poking the hole in it or tearing it or shutting down the uh, proton motive pumps or uh, affecting the ability for the sodium potassium pumps to work, we can alter or, uh, you know, we can kill a eukaryotic cell and we really want to target that for bacteria. If we can find a way of getting through their cell uh, membrane um, with some of these antimicrobials, we can go in and we can cause the cell to lyse or uh, crenate. Uh, we can go in and we can affect the, uh, the plasma membrane. We'll talk about that when we talk about disinfectants and antimicrobials. So if disinfectants or antimicrobials are still going to, the mode of action is going to be similar. So it's going to work on the cell wall. It's going to work on the cell membrane. It's going to work on the ribosomes. It's going to work on um, sulfidamides. It's going to work on metabolism. It's going to work on folic acid. Um, you know, how are these things going to work? And we want to harness the differences between a prokaryote and eukaryote so we can effectively um, get rid of a prokaryotic cell without damaging our own eukaryotic cells. We'll talk a little bit about DNA, um, the chromosomes, ribosomes, metabolic capacities, 
I'm going to spend a little time on the ribosomes. Uh, you will probably find it boring, but when we start talking about protein synthesis and how these organisms make things, we'll try to tie it in. And we also, when we get into a lot of the antimicrobials, there's a whole plethora of antimicrobials or antibiotics that work on the different subunits of ribosomes, all right? which is great because all bacteria have ribosomes. The only issue um, is that the ribosome, well, the ribosomes of a eukaryote and prokaryotic are different, except the ribosomes of a prokaryotic cell have the same size as the ribosomes of the eukaryotic uh, mitochondria. All right, so keep that in mind. And if I, I don't want to forget, but please realize that your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother only. Another little um, something. So this should be a video. Um, so watch this. This guy's uh, a really good artist, graphic artist, and he'll talk. And I really like his accent, um, but he'll be talking about the modes of action on uh, so any of the videos that you can find on him if you want to pop into YouTube and find that they're just kind of entertaining so if you're tired of um, taking notes or reading stuff over and over again pop into YouTube um, or pop into Blackboard and just grab a video um, like I said the class is going to be you know five maybe six weeks long and it's going to be coming at you very very quickly so rather than watching uh, you know, Netflix or whatever you're doing, you know, other than working or studying, you know, go in and watch a video um, in small chunks, 20, 30 minutes, maybe max. Um, please don't try to um, study the day or night before your exam because there's just too much information. If you can do it, fantastic. I'm not capable of doing that. I have to uh, basically do uh, 20, 30 minute chunks, and I can't just cram. So, you know, if you want to take a day off before an exam and study, if that works for you, great. Um, it doesn't work for me and doesn't work for most people, but some people can do that. So anyway, so eukaryotic cells would be animals, plants, fungus, fungi, and protists. So these are gonna be very, very large in comparison to um, prokaryotes. And the difference is they have organelles. So they're gonna have um, literally it means small organs, so they're going to have organelles, and when we get into chapter five, I think, talking about the, the different organelles, whether it's the nucleus, ribosome, smooth ER, rough ER, Golgi apparatus, um, you know, these uh, vesicles that we transport stuff through exocytosis and things like that, we're going to be talking about the, the organelles, and they have very, very specific jobs and functions, and please realize that not every cell is going to have every organelle. So if it is a, let's say it's a liver cell and it has to produce a lot of uh, proteins for enzyme production, or if it's making nucleotides or proteins. So you would have to say, well, it's making proteins. So it's going to obviously have a lot more uh, ribosomes and they're going to be rough ER, not smooth ER. Smooth ER is going to be more for uh, lipid production. Rough ER is more for ribosomes and we'll see that the ribosomes are gonna um, make amino acids using that nucleotide, nucleotide codon. We'll see that coming up. So these are compartmentalized uh, in the cytoplasm, perform very specific functions. Um, nucleotide cells, key thing here is they contain double membrane bound nucleus with DNA and chromosomes. All right, so I'm, I have to assume that you've all Heard of a nucleus, you've heard of DNA, and it's inside the nucleus. So we literally don't want the DNA to ever leave the nucleus because if we alter the DNA, any part of that structure, then we have mutations. And then if we have mutations, uh, subsequent mutations after that with some um, oncogenes and maybe some um, cancer causing carcinogens, then we're going to, you know, open ourselves up to some kind of cancerous mutation. So we want the DNA to stay in the nucleus. We don't ever want it to leave, all right? And if we're talking about viruses, viruses, uh, if it's a DNA virus, it has to get into the, the nucleus and it can go in and hijacks the nucleus and the DNA and starts replicating uh, for itself. Uh, but that's a different 
different subject altogether. So with DNA and uh, eukaryote, we want to we want to get you know RNA is going to be that um, mirror copy of it that actually can leave the DNA in the cytoplasm and it can reassemble. And then we're going to um, you know, send a code to the ribosomes and the ribosomes are going to make very specific um, amino acids in a certain sequence depending on the DNA uh, instructions using uh, three nucleotides, which is a codon uh, to make very specific things. It's going to have a start and stop sequence. Um, when we start talking about uh, bacteria, if we can go in and we can hijack that mechanism with some of these antimicrobials that work on the uh, the ribosomes, we can have it make faulty uh, proteins, or we can have it. Um, you know, we can use um, analogs, which are sort of like fake nucleotides. We can make it um, stop halfway through a sequence. So realize that if we can do that, uh, if we can make a bacteria make faulty enzymes or proteins at some point in time it won't be able to replicate and that's how we can kill them all right so um we'll talk about that uh, so prokaryotes so u means true nucleocaryote is like a nucle true nucleus prokaryote don't have a nucleus so that's going to be the bacteria and archaea and i mentioned before we're not going to really go into the archaea because like i said they're not going to be medically clinically relevant for uh, you at this point, uh, or you know, maybe they are, but um, I'm assuming you're taking this course with me for more or less clinically relevant microbiology for entrance exams or for whatever program you're going into, physical therapy, dental, um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, nursing, you know, pre-med of any sort, just some basic um, microbiology, but uh, in any case, they have no nucleus or any membrane-bound organelle. So in lab, you know, we a question we like to ask is, you know, you needed oil immersion to see the bacteria because it was so small. You needed that um, <clears> thousand <throat> x magnification with the oil immersion to see the bacteria as clear as possible, and then we'll ask you, did you see any membrane-bound uh, organelles? Yes or no, or if you did, what were they? Well, you shouldn't because they don't have any, right? So here, I'm gonna try to use this thing. I don't. I tried to draw on. I could draw on it, but then it gets really sketchy. All right, sketchy isn't good, just sketchy. So um, here's a prokaryote, and you'll see that it has um, a little bit different structure. And there's a cell wall, cell membrane, and then flagella. I talked about those in the lab. So these are going to be for motility. And we'll see that uh, towards the end of the course. We'll have something. I didn't do a thing. What? Well, see, it's going bonkers. So we'll back it up. I literally. Okay, so it's going forward now. Can't even make this stuff up. No, it's literally going. I haven't done a thing. Okay. Okay. I'm just gonna move on here. <clears throat> All right. Characteristics of life. So, reproduction and heredity. So, please realize, if an organism is not able to reproduce, there's no um survival of the fittest, there's no perpetuation of the species. So uh, they have to be able to reproduce and with reproduction, there's gonna be a heredity or um, genetic information transferred. Uh, if it's eukaryotic, you know, we're gonna, uh, you know, as mammals, you know, we know we have half the, the genetic information comes from um, mom and dad. When the sperm and egg unite, there's instantly life. No one can explain how it happens. It's, you know, some, one of the mysteries of the universe. But with bacteria, they reproduce through binary fission. And I talked about that yesterday with the streak plates and how we can get a single bacterium to replicate over and over again, depending on the, the organism every 20 to 30 minutes for basic <clears throat> bacteria. Um, 
TB uh, reproduces much, much slower. Um, like Yersinia pesta or um, leprosy, those are probably the slowest. They take forever to reproduce, right? Maybe we'll talk about that as, as we go on. <clears throat> so the genome is composed of DNA packed and the chromosomes produce offspring sexually or asexually. And we'll, when we talk about the moles and fungus, they can do either or, right? So we need growth and development, right? So there's no point in, in having an organism. It has to grow, whether it's a vegetative cell that grows or if it is an infant that grows or a newly formed bacterium through binary fission. They have to grow. And if we're talking about the human cells, you know, we have that growth phase, we have the the replication, and then it has to grow in order to divide to, to grow again. And we only want that to grow when needed. We don't want it to grow when it doesn't need doesn't need. There's got to be a need for it to reproduce. All right. If it's reproducing without a need, um, or if it doesn't have contact inhibition or doesn't have to do apoptosis, those are all key signs of a cell that is cancerous, but that's beyond the scope of this course per se at the moment. So metabolism is chemical and physical life processes. And metabolism, please realize it is all of your chemical and metabolic processes. So that's, you know, whether it's internal, external respiration, breathing, it's all, metabolism is all of them. People just think metabolism is, you know, um, whether their metabolism runs fast or slow, but metabolic, that's metabolic rate, but your metabolism itself is all the processes, whether it's uh, catabolism or anabolism, breaking up or breaking down through dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis, it's all part of metabolism, right? So movement and irritability. All right, so uh, like humans, bacteria will, they'll, um, run towards something, it's called a run or tumble. With the vagella, they'll move towards something, chemotaxis, something that they'll find positive, um, they'll move away from something that is negative. Same with us, you know, we tend to hopefully move towards things that are pleasurable or um, that we need, and we tend to back away from things that um, are um, dangerous or deleterious, and a lot of those things are learned reflexes as children or your infants, or your parents told you just don't do that. So they respond to internal external stimuli, self propulsion of many organisms. So if there's a bacteria and it's floating around and it picks up a chemical gradient of something it wants, it's going to kind of, if it can, has motility, it's going to move towards it. If it's, if it realizes, oh, you know what, the pH is changing or there's something toxic, if it senses it, it's going to try to move away from it. So it's going to follow that chemical gradient. All right, so cell support, detection, and storage mechanisms. So we'll talk about some vacuoles. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about um, the structure of it. Um, actually, have actin, just like you know, we've heard of actin and myosin for humans. Um, protection, slime layers, capsules, um, pili, I guess. We're talking about strep. There's great big carbohydrate and proteins and strep that uh, help it evade phagocytosis by our immune system. There's vacuoles, granules, and occlusions. You know, vacuoles are, could be for buoyancy, for something that uh, is uh, phototropic. It wants to float towards the surface of the water where the sunlight would be brighter. Or um, you know, some bacteria have uh, sensors for um, magnetic force. They can actually, they can tune into the geometric magnetic force of the Earth and um, <clears throat> and gravitate towards that. Granules and inclusions. So there's no um, grocery stores with Tim Hortons for the bacteria. So if there is something, there's a, a plethora of something in the area, it will uh, bring it in. You know, it may have to chemically alter it and then bring it in through the cell membrane and then it wants to store it in granules or inclusions, well, usually granules um, for the time when it might not be around, it has to carry it around with it, it has extra food. Or uh, if it's something that they that they may need in the future, they're gonna store it. Inclusions really 
uh, if you're looking at something you see an occlusion, really that is probably um, metabolic waste, or it's um, we could probably say it's an older bacterium. Right? And then transport of nutrients and waste, um, that's going to all be done through the cell membrane. Right? Okay, so here's structure of a bacterial cell. And like if we're looking at, similar if we're looking at a eukaryotic cell, not every bacterium has these and not every eukaryotic cell has everything that we'll see in the, um, the molecular model, right? But here are some of the major things we'll be talking about. Um, basically, actin would be, when you think of actin, you're going to think of actin and myosin as muscle fibers, right? So, these are going to be there for structure. We'll see, um, coming up, we'll have uh, some bacteria that have periplasmic 9-2 uh, um, arrangement of actin fibers, so they can actually twist and turn, like, um, Podium for um, syphilis or whatever, it's, it's a corkscrew. It, it can um, twist and get in through your mucous membranes, right? and we'll see that coming up. Uh, what slime layers are exactly what they are. They're slime or um, glycocoax. They're slime layers that, that either help it um, stick to something, uh, they protect it from dehydration uh, and drying out, and they can really, um, help the cell from being uh, engulfed by our macrophages or our immune system. Fimbrae, when we see this, these are like um, burrs or whatever they can, they adhere to tissue, cell, uh, walls. Uh, they're really, E. coli likes to attach to the um, urinary tract, all right? And it, can, it attaches, so even if you're urinating, you're not gonna flush that out. And if it has fimbrae and of, Flagella, it can move, and it, it can move up the urethra towards the kidney, you know, against the, uh, the gradient there, per se. Cell wall would be very similar to ours, just for protection. Um, cell membrane, once again, that's really the, I don't want to say diffuse membrane, but it's really what um, the bacteria uses to control what comes in and out of the cell, all right? Um, the other thing we'll talk about, um, in a little bit of detail is the um, pillus, and this is usually only in gram-negative bacteria and for conjugation. So this bacteria can go dock up next to another bacteria, and it can um, it can it can transfer genetic information for virulence factors, but it is not used for reproduction. All right, so just remember, it's going to just send. Um, virulence factors, you can think of them as superpowers or some, some way that this bacteria has an advantage to evade our immune system or helps it survive. It can send that information to another related <clears throat> um, gram-negative bacterium and it can send it information. So then any subsequent progeny from that bacterium after it gets that information through binary fission will have that uh, virulence factor, so it's pretty cool. Flagellum, um, these are just for rotation, and like I said, they're going to either run or tumble. So it's, it's kind of like a propeller. It goes one way to go forward, it goes the opposite way to go backwards, and it's going to run or tumble towards or away from uh, something positive or negative. In the blackboard, I think I put some videos of just their structure. Um, Want to see it? They're not real long. There, in here, there should be a video on um, bacteria moving. I don't know why the graphics aren't working um, in the MacBook. They work on my desktop at school. I don't know. I, I can't figure this stuff out. So ex external structures, we'll talk about them. In lab, we're going to try to do flagellar stain. I'm going to try to do capsule stain. We'll see endospores up, coming up here uh, soon. So I'm going to introduce all this stuff, and as we get into the specific um, clustering or bacilli, or any of these spore formers, we'll, uh, we'll come across it again. But when we come across it, at least you'll have heard it, right? 
So two major groups of appendages would be for motility or movement, we have flagella or axial filaments. So periplasmic flagella um, are more or less, they're, some of them are internal, and then we'll, we'll see like how flagella, they might have peritriturous, amitriturous, monotriturous, what, where is the um, flagella located? If it's peritriturous, it can, um, those flagella can move, and this thing can literally spin and turn, all right? Um, if it's only on one end, monotriturous are going to only go one way. If it's peri or amphitriturous, it can be on both ends. So on the midterm um, for a lab, if we give you a picture of that, just tell us. It's peri, it's mono, it's whatever it is. So it's just so we know that you know that bacterium can have different arrangements of flagella and they're there for uh, motion. All right, and I said before, I said the the um, fimbrae are those little burrs that um, that can attach to um, structures and hold it in place. And the pili really, um, it's for conjugation, um, for just transfer of genetic information, but um, they'll try to trick you. It's not for reproduction. It's genetic information for virulence factors. Glyco. Colex. So whenever you see glyco, when you think of sugar, glycogen, um, yeah, just think of sugar. So realize this is a sugar protein mix. So it's a surface coating. It can help it with um, against phagocytosis. And sometimes it can have um, markers in it or uh, it can help, it ha can hold structures for um, attachment and for uh, specific um, structures that are in the, the outside of the bacterium. All right. So here's the flagella. So this is gram positive, all right, and gram negative. So they just attach differently. They pretty much work similar. So the filament is a long, thin structure composed of the protein flagellin, all right. And we'll talk, we'll be doing flagellar stains later. Um, because flagella is, the bacteria is small enough to see the flagella is even smaller. So we have to do like a negative stain where the, um, the flagella will repel the stain, but the stain will be outside the flagella and you'll be able to see the contrast. It's sort of um, like putting, I guess you could say it's like putting mascara on the flagella just so you can see the, the, um, Contrast, like contrast media on the outside of it. You see it. The hook is the curved surface. All right. The basal body is, is important. It's just really how it attaches. And they all attach in the cell membrane. Um, we're going to see gram positive and gram negative coming up here. All saw that the mouse was nowhere near that, right? And it's possessed. Satan. Um, I swear to God. All right. We'll talk about ground positive and negative when they come up again. All right. So flagella can cause it to rotate 360 degrees. Here's that peritriturus. And I said it can it can literally rotate, flip, and do whatever it wants in, in a very coordinated way. It's pretty amazing um, if you like that kind of thing. Here's um, a monotriturus flagella. Jello. All right. <clears throat> That's Loptrichias. It's got more than one there. Perry. Okay. Yeah, so there it is. I'm just showing you um, the different structures. Um, this is ampy on both, like ambidextrous, left and right, or on both ends. There's Perry. Um, there's Loptrichias, and there's Monotrichias. So, you know, we could just give you a picture of that on a midterm. It's an easy question, right? So, flagellar. Okay, flagellar responses. So, guide to bacteria in the direction in response to external stimulus. So, once again, it's going to go by chemotaxis, the chemical gradient. Chemical stimulus, 
right? So positive or negative, if it's something it, it wants or needs or likes, it's gonna go towards it. Um, if it is negative, it's gonna tumble away, all right? So counterclockwise is a run, all right? Clockwise is a tumble. So if it wants to go towards something, it goes counterclockwise. If it wants to go move away from it, it goes the other direction, all right? Okay. And here's that periplasma flagella. I said this is how um, syphilis and uh, some other organisms that like to burrow, they go in like a corkscrew and they rotate into the um, membrane, the mucous membrane. Okay, so internal flagella are enclosed in the space between the outer sheath and the cell wall peptoglycan layer. And that's kind of just showing you the arrangement there. So these can actually, they just twist and that causes them to rotate. All right. Um, all right, so now if this is actually working, you'll, you'll actually, maybe I can get it to work. You'll actually see these things move. That's Pseudomonas. Working. So pseudomonas, if you're in lab, I <clears throat> showed you guys that it was the one that smelled like grapes. All right, and pseudomonas literally grows on everything. It doesn't even need <clears throat> sugar as a um, carbon source. It can live on mops, sponges. It likes to live on bar soap. We'll talk about that. All right, so that was flagella action. Good Lord. Okay, so fimbrae. So these are really things that, that help these things adhere. And this is E. coli, the fimbrae attaching to your intestinal wall. So sometimes they can release um, toxic substances like uh, shigella because they're related to it. Uh, which can cause secretory diarrhea. So it actually causes your digestive tract, the cells to expel the ions, especially sodium and water follows. So now you have this secretory or watery diarrhea and cause a lot of inflammation. And usually if it's, uh, the toxin isn't bad enough to cause uh, it to damage the cells. And if that's the case, you have like bloody diarrhea and we'll talk about um, that with um, some shigella and, and things in the, that are definitely in the lower, lower digestive tract right before the large intestine. But um, the fimbrae are what causes it to attach. And if anyone, you've heard of a UTI or urinary tract infection, they're hard to get rid of because usually E. coli is, is um, the main villain with that, right? So it's in your digestive tract, it's part of your microbiome. But if it gets uh, in your urinary tract or it gets in your, um, all right, so if E. coli leaves, <clears throat> leaves your digestive tract and it gets in your respiratory tract, your um, GI or your reproductive tract, your eyes, um, anywhere it doesn't belong, it can cause some problems. But in your intestines, you kind of want it there. It helps break down your food and it really, um, it's comp for some of the other pathogenic things like a Clostridium difficile C. diff, right? <clears throat> so function and adhesion to other cells and surfaces, and that's why, you know, <clears throat> you're, if you're peeing, you can't get rid of it, you know, there's, uh, because it's literally attaching to the bladder, it can work its way up to the ureter, and then if it gets, in, it works its way all the way up the ureter to the kidney, now you can have nephrophorosis, or neph um, yeah, nephrophoritis and some major, major issues. Guys, I'm really sorry about this. All right, <clears throat> All right so pili, once again, these are called conjugation pili, and they're really there. They literally, they pull up next to the other E. coli, and they just kind of ram the uh, pili into the other uh, related species, and they just give it genetic information. So rigid tubular structure made of pillin protein found only in gram-negative cells. Function to join bacterial cells for partial DNA transfer called conjugation. 
and for the fourth time it's not for a replication um, of the cell itself it's just going to pass on <clears throat> variance factor is going to uh, change the genetic code to uh, it's going to upload it's going to do a they call that I mean, damn phone or this iPhone or every time it has to update it gives it a genetic update <clears throat> here's a glyco colex remember glyco means sugar so coating of molecules external to the cell wall made of sugars and or proteins and then we also have a slime layer and a capsule all right and if you were in lab we saw that um streptococcal pneumonia and we actually could see the shadow of a, a capsule on that when we do a capsular stain on klebsiella it has a really thick capsule <clears throat> and just think of that as a really um thick chewy protein or like a rubbery coating so when your macrophages or monocytes go into engulf that and try to digest it with digestive enzymes it it can or it can but it's 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 a little bit harder to get through it's kind of an extra protection or a, a, an armored suit or whatever you know however we want to think about it slime layers um our mucus a little bit of sugar on there and they help it from dehydrating and help it with attachment right. so i wrote all this stuff out here for you um in red and blue so it protects from dehydration protects from loss of nutrients serves for adhesion all right Slimers capsules, like I said, they're thicker, um, and they really help it um, evade the immune system. Is that a little bit of an advantage? Give up. No, I'll never. Just aggravated. <clears throat> All right. So we'll be talking about biofilms, like the plaque on your teeth. So protect cells from dehydration and nutrient loss, inhibit killing by white blood cells and by phagocytosis, and it helps it become more pathogenic. So what happens is the initial bacterium will attach to something with a slime layer or, um, yeah, let's just call it a slime layer capsule. So it'll start fermenting things around it. When it ferments things around it, it changes the pH. It changes the external environment and then another bacteria comes along and it has a little niche market for that specific um, environment it starts growing and then it changes the environment another one so you have all of these and there's there should be a video coming up um if it works and i'll play it for you uh these things grow on top of each other and the the cool sort of cool thing about it is whatever is in the initial part of the biofilm or in the middle of that great big biofilm even if we have antibiotics or immune system they're going to start attacking the superficial bacteria first so the ones that are deep the initial ones they're pretty much protected they can't nothing can get to them because of the biofilm and that's kind of why the plaque in your teeth the initial um let's just say it's strep viridens or strep um, mutans is going to start attaching to your teeth it's going to start consuming that sugar uh, fermenting that sugar and it's going to change the ph to something very very acidic and that's what starts you know eating through the enamel of your teeth and then more and more bacteria start growing on top of that and i talked to you guys in lab if you have me for lab and i said there's literally uh probably over 500 different types of microbes in your mouth and uh somebody was talking about um you know we'll give you the swabs to, to do your nutrient plants they're talking about their dog and i you know i literally said uh you're better off uh you know making out with your dog because it literally but your dog's mouth is probably cleaner than the human mouth that has less bacteria in it all right and this is a, a form of attachment formation of biofilms all right so biofilms are our um big concern right now in healthcare because we have biofilms on all kinds of um of 
uh, pick lines or a lot of these uh, uh, lines and they're very hard to get rid of. Oh, please tell me this is gonna work. Come on, where's the arrow? Yeah, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and just watch this. I think, if I remember correctly, it's really loud, really fast or something. Oh, come on. Let's do binary fission. These are all growing on top of each other. That's 3D of how they're growing. Okay, this thing is literally plugged in. What a disaster. So anyway, that was pretty cool. I mean, Legos are cool, but not cooler than that. All right, so there's biofilm on a catheter. All right, so just realize there's there are many, many layers of bacteria and it really can, um, like the, the, the calculus on your teeth, you, once it really gets there and it starts literally almost turning into cement, you have to, um go on and have it scraped off and i'm sure that if you're going into healthcare you're going to see patients and you're going to look at them and i've had a few of them i look at their teeth and i'm like have you brushed or flossed those since you were six and you just want to get like a chisel and it's just start chiseling away all that plaque anyway digressing as always all right so the cell envelope We'll talk a little bit more, well, a lot more about the gram stain. So we, if things work out next week, beginning of June, we'll be doing our simple stains and gram stains, and you'll be uh, staining the bacteria. And we're gonna, I'm gonna go over the gram stain today. So please start learning the steps of the gram stain, the primary stain, the mortent, the counter stain, and the how it works. Um, I think there should be a video on gram stain or literally um, Pearson has a really good um, video on the gram stain. I'll see if I can get that to attach. I put it in there and it didn't open up, but that nothing surprises me. Anyway, so uh, the external covering outside of the cytoplasm is a cell envelope similar to our cell wall, but um, a little bit different. Composed, composed of two basic layers. So there's a cell wall and a cell, cell membrane, All right? So gram positives have a very, 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 can be eight to 100 layers of um, uh, the cell uh, wall. Gram negative have like an outer membrane, a cell wall, and then an inner membrane. So um, the, the cell wall is a little bit, thinner or well, a lot thinner, but it has two cell membranes. So it's much harder for antimicrobials to get uh, into a gram negative. So it's gonna maintain the cell integrity. Two different groups of bacteria are demonstrated by the gram stain. So gram positive is always gonna be purple. Gram negative, if it's donor, it's gonna be pink. Uh, from safranin, gram positive is gonna be um, purple from crystal violet. All right, so thick cell wall composed primarily of a peptidoglycan glycan and a cell membrane. And I said that peptidoglycan glycan can be um, 
40, 80, 100 layers thick. And um, there's NAG and NAM units in between there that are kind of like the mortar between cinder blocks. And that's really how penicillin works. It goes and starts breaking up those um, protein bonds and then we can get, we can cause the cell to, to um, lice because what happens is the osmotic pressure uh, is higher outside of the cell than in. So the osmotic pressure from the external environment goes in and just causes that cell to burst. So the gram positive, it really needs that cell wall to uh, protect it from the um, osmotic pressure of the external environment. So gram negative bacteria from an outer cell membrane, a thin peptidoglycan layer and an internal cell membrane. So please know that. It's really central dogma for microbiology. The gram stain is the gold standard um, for determining whether something's gram positive or gram negative. And it really helps us <clears throat> determine the organism. We can go by the, the, uh, morphology, uh, the morphology of the cell. Is it a rod? Is it a cocci? Um, diplococci? You know, what is a gram positive? Gram negative? Is it a fimbrae? We can kind of uh, know what it is or what um, genus. We might not know what species, but we'll kind of have an idea of what it is. Um, <clears throat> helps us determine our um, treatment or, you know, what mode of action do we want to use. All right, so determines the, the cell, structure of the cell wall determines the shape, prevents lysis due to changing in osmotic pressures, as I stated. Peptidyl glycan, peptoprotein, glycan sugar is a, is a primary component. <clears throat> you need macromolecules, so that means it's large, composed of a repeating framework of long glycan chains cross-linked by short peptide fragments. And these are nano -nag units. Peptide, so when you see peptide, you're thinking protein. Um, so <clears throat> there's the NAG and NAM units. All right, so penicillin goes in and just kind of breaks apart these, uh, I don't really know this too much, <clears throat> these um, peptide fragments causing it to break. So think about that. If you had, um, um, <clears throat> in your basement, if you had um, cracks in the mortar and water kept coming in and there was no way to stop it, eventually, you know, theoretically, your basement would flood. Kind of similar to that. It's the uh, mode of action for, uh, Penicillin or the penicillin derivatives for gram positive. Um, we all kind of know now that a lot of these things um, are resistant to penicillin. They can make some of these gram positive bacteria can make enzymes that make penicillin ineffective. And that's why we have to keep making these third, fourth generation semi synthetic penicillins, cephalosporin, and things like that. So gram positive cell wall. If I like to ask you a question, so just remember they're thicker. They're going to have tachoic or lipo, lipo, lipo. So you should be thinking fat. Tachoic acid function in cell wall maintenance. Right? And realize these cell walls have to keep regenerating um, as they're exposed to things. And the when we do the gram stain, we're going to be using very very young or new gram positive. Actually, when we do it, I will make sure that the, the um, what I'll make the stains for will be very, very young cells because they stain much better. If you were to do a gram stain and it stains really badly or really light or really poorly, either you did the gram stain wrong, the stain was old, but that really doesn't matter. Or we can say, you know what, those cells were just old. You know, they were um, and old. By old, I mean a few days old. We want something that's 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 uh, young and it's going through constant binary fission because through binary fission that cell uh, wall is growing and that's what that's what stains it takes up the dye, right? Because inside of that wall is slightly negative, the dye is going to be um, a basic dye. It's going to be it's going to be attack the positive charge is going to. Um, go inside the cell membrane attached to that negative inside the cell wall. All right, so it's gonna adhere inside. <clears throat> All right, so uh, moves cations across the cell envelope, stimulate a specific immune response. So the lipotocholic acid and tocholic acid, so 
gram positive bacteria, they, they release a lot of um, exotoxins, which can make people very, very sick. Um, if you've ever, you know, had a staph aureus food infection, you know, food intoxication, sorry. Intoxication. can't even all right i am assuming we're recording what in the hell it's like i uh... progress stop this just in case